Hello, welcome to the lecture of rainwater harvesting. We have basically two options. We can go on the pathway of destruction, of degradation, of loss of land, or we can go for a green planet, restore areas that have been uh, destroyed, degraded, and create a green planet. And that's what we can do to make a balanced climate. That's the key issue. And at the same time, we will restore water and food security. Um, around the world, we still see many, many areas where there is uh, severe degradation going on. And as you see, the worst areas are very often not in the uh, suspect areas. To the contrary, in those areas where the situation is bad, has been bad since a very long time, we have some improvement. And this is very often due to uh, rainwater harvesting and uh, very often, um, well, single people getting active and uh, not accepting the uh, degradation and loss of livelihoods anymore and becoming active. So maybe uh, there is a certain threshold that situation must become really bad, that people become active. Uh, but um, the good news is can be done. And so let's explore options, what we can do with respect to rainwater harvesting. So even in the north here, northern Germany, we see more and more uh, irrigation. And we didn't have that. We simply didn't have that. Groundwater levels are dropping, and with that we will have a uh, well, uh, dire situation if this is continuing. And um, it may well be that our um, area that was always considered uh, very wet is turning into a savanna area over the next couple of years. So, the outline. So, let's look at um, systems thinking again, soil, water and food. That's basically what we call nexus engineering because we, we, we see the different components and we see the interaction and we are not only looking at one specific uh, technique or approach. And today I will present the basics of rainwater harvesting, integration into the overall uh, situation small-scale rainwater harvesting and rainwater harvesting on catchment level. And that's uh, what can really change the face of the earth. Basics. So, rainwater harvesting provides alternative water supply for domestic uses, semi-arid, arid climate with water shortages, uh, emergency areas, uh, areas where the, we have a breakdown of the public water supply systems. Um, rainwater harvesting is decentralized and therefore suitable also for scattered settlements and agricultural operations that are uh, further apart. Uh, it can be made easy with low cost materials, local materials, mainly labor and less uh, investment costs. Uh, it can improve the groundwater uh, quantity and quality. Uh, watershed systems can enhance soil moisture. Productivity can be improved and uh, thus the food security can become uh, better. Can reduce soil erosion and counteract uh, flooding. Uh, but make no mistake, if rainwater harvesting is done in a poor way, it can also contribute to erosion because if you uh, build terraces that are breaking down uh, during uh, the following years, erosion can be worse. So good planning, even if it's low tech, good planning and the know-how is crucial. There are simple uh, traditional systems and those can be adapted to different climates. 
So rainwater harvesting components and structures. So we do have uh, catchments, we have gutters, we have conduits, pipes, filters, storage facilities, recharge structures and actually groundwater recharge is one of the strongholds of rainwater harvesting because the groundwater, if it is available, is a key resource for uh, well, long-term water stability. While with a uh, storage um, tank you can uh, go over a few weeks, maybe a month if it's really big, uh, but uh, replenishing the groundwater, rising the groundwater table significantly has and does bring villages through two, three years without any rainfall, as it has happened in Gujarat, for example, in uh, Western India. So, the technologies. Uh, we have the simple um, rooftop systems, and of course the catchment is the roof area. Uh, they are mostly uh, connected to a tank or a underground reservoir and uh, then we have um, the uh, distinguishing between in situ and ex situ. In situ would be um, directly in the space where we do the um, harvesting while ex situ is that we use a, a wider catchment area so catching water from here and transporting it down to uh, an agricultural operation over there. And these would be uh, like with uh, check dams, swales, uh, while in situ is often terracing, contour ridges, and uh, you work with soil profile very much. And uh, you also work with soil profile uh, in ex situ. Uh, the distinguishing is, of course, uh, if you use an outside catchment for uh, restoring water or you are working with in the space um, of the agricultural operation or of the village or of the house. Um, technology choice. Um, it should be chosen on local, biophysical and socio-economic characteristics, of course based on rainfall, intensity and frequency and unfortunately uh, because we have messed up the climate mainly through deforestation, uh, destruct destruction of soils, uh, we do not have regular patterns uh, so much anymore. So monsoons may fail or uh, be shifting um, and uh, that makes it more difficult to do proper planning. But doing nothing is worse than ever. Uh, land use is crucial. Um, well, we may have rooftop, rooftop harvesting, parking lots in more uh, urban settings. Uh, we can have recreational ponds uh, in the landscape that also may suit uh, touristic purposes. We can do the system of combining with um, fish production, uh, utilization of um, floating plants and so on. Um, we can have uh, agricultural land. Uh, the terraces are centuries or even thousands of years old. Uh, contour ridges, pits and runs. Uh, trenches and uh, that is something that is and has been very very successful. The areas where you have a big catchment with terraces you will normally have water flowing around the year while the catchment that where water is running off fast uh, in the dry part of the year uh, you will uh, not have running creeks anymore. Um, we can have open areas, percolation ponds, infiltration galleries, community wells, farm ponds. Then we have to look at uh, the soil texture and depths and um, 
of course where is the groundwater level if we have any groundwater not all areas have groundwater slopes are crucial of course and uh, slopes are making it um, possible at all to do uh, the ex situ uh, rainwater harvesting because if there is only flat land the transport would be difficult so you would normally work with the land uh, where you want to uh, have the water harvested uh, economic and social aspects are crucial and usually economic feasibility is uh, absolute key because working in a in a large area uh, will cost some money even if you take um, well local materials and uh, you rely mainly on uh, on labor and not so much on machines um, there will be some uh, need for uh, bringing up money um, and in order to do such projects uh, it is necessary to work on a community level uh, well educate people about the options and uh, then uh, there are the techniques how to work with communities uh, get to um, well uh, informed choice and get people to work together um, acceptance is the key and uh, you should be aware that for money people it's really really difficult to um, imagine how it can be most people cannot imagine how things could be and they only see what they see and what they did experience and so it is crucial to uh, make examples small-scale pilot projects to uh, show how it can be done and also to prove it uh, to be working in the given situation and examples um, are the key to success so if you can show examples if there are some around get people there um, show them what can be done let those who did it explain to the others what can be done and um, this is normally the most successful type of uh, community involvement to, to show them how things work in neighboring communities video is sort of helpful so you can even arrange for open air cinema at some place and uh, show good examples in uh, local language yeah well the uh, large scale um, the whole water catchment uh, that is something where we would have well this whole catchment and uh, the water would be well that should be in blue of course so the runoff would be directed into the field from a larger area and uh, so you would sort of multiply the water availability by all this uh, catchment and just as a reminder catchment is the area from an, where the water goes this direction and that would be part of this sub catchment or and water that goes to the other side would be part of uh, the neighboring catchment and it mustn't be always the ridge uh, here there can be infiltration here and that can still percolate through in, especially in uh, well mountains with crevices there is a, a great book on rainwater harvesting by uh, always and basic concepts of water harvesting for agriculture and he has a very nice uh, uh, picture here farming with 150 millimeters of annual rainfall sounds completely impossible so these would be very dry savanna areas if not deserts but it is possible so uh, it's not possible if you try to take the whole area in this example like four hectare 
because everything would get too dry. Maybe you could like have cactus growing and that can also produce uh, edible stuff, uh, but that would be very restricted. And now if you choose to go for like designating half of the land uh, to the rainwater harvesting, you would have double the water availability for the remaining land and then uh, it's equivalent to not exactly but uh, roughly to the direction of 250 millimeters or something and taking it a step further if the situation allows so um, in in savanna areas uh, well the the land available is often abundant because nobody can really make use of it very much and with that uh, you can uh, sort of get water from this part of the area and then you could have a, a decent amount of water what might be equivalent uh, to like maybe four to five hundred uh, millimeters sorry writing with the mouse is not so uh, good, I have the other computer now, so whoops. Uh, great examples uh, can be seen and one of the videos I like the most is the lessons of the Lost Plateau by John D. Liu and absolutely great and it shows how things can be done. Uh, let me just, so now here there is the whole title hope in a changing climate and if you search for John D. Liu in YouTube you will find a lot of good examples and this is an area where uh, over thousands of years this land was barren and dry because it was destroyed uh, thousands of years back so look at this barren land here that's not productive anymore um, and uh, only 10 years later photograph from the same place shows how it has been restored look at these areas very productive uh, people are uh, well wealthy now while they were uh, there was uh, well poverty before poverty migration now there is a reverse migration because people see their land is productive again and so they can move out of overcrowded cities and have a good life out in the rural and especially if they organize farming work in a proper way uh, it can be a great life indeed so rainwater harvesting it's combination of um, many techniques to supply rainwater collected from surfaces roofs ground surface rock surface for domestic or agricultural use and main components catchment areas storage reservoir and also the delivery system is part of it because sometimes you have to get water quite a, a long distance from where it is captured to where it may be used. But now, uh, being in a Nexus lecture, of course, we will look at the overall picture. Uh, and uh, so we will see what should be done first. Before you start, look for the overall situation, topography, soil quality. Uh, is it uh, like a sponge or is it rock? Are there forests in the slopes? Is there illegal logging, uh, destructive grazing, unplanned grazing? Um, the legal situation, um, stakeholders, community groups, and all that. And with discussion on rainwater harvesting, it is mostly that uh, people are not looking at the uh, overall situation uh, but uh, rather looking at uh, well the, their project by itself so I want to 
go a step back before we jump into more details to look at what needs to be looked at in the in the wider context. So integration with the overall situation. Um, it is the well vegetation cover that does the natural rainwater harvesting. We should always remember rainwater harvesting is a completely natural thing. Uh, nature works with rainwater harvesting um, every day of the year uh, because um, vegetation cover makes either the water runoff um, and disappear or makes the water go into the ground, uh, replenish the groundwater, and uh, that is something where we really uh, have to look at the uh, overall situation. So this is where we want to go. We want to have a, a healthy situation, and uh, but to get from from here to there you will very often need, you guess it, rainwater harvesting. It's a repair mechanism in many cases. And once the region is restored, the well vegetation, natural vegetation is back, be it good agriculture, appropriate agriculture, um, be it uh, forests that have regrown, um, or uh, also like terraces for gardening operations. Uh, that's a situation that then goes back to natural rainwater harvesting uh, with uh, the vegetation itself. Um, when you consider restoring an area, uh, you should not only look at topography, soil quality, groundwater level, but um, if we want to make rainwater harvesting a success, it should be always combined with uh, reforestation, with agroforestry, with uh, proper uh, rain-fed agriculture. Uh, and uh, that agriculture should be working out well, because otherwise the whole system may fail uh, for example, because the whole region does have a, a boron deficiency. And uh, so uh, boron and zinc are uh, very crucial uh, and they are lacking in, in many soils. And so you, if you do a great job with rainwater harvesting, you feed this water um, to a like to, to any type of agriculture, but this agriculture is failing because of a boron or zinc deficiency or even both. Um, that would be a failure of the project in the long run, even if everything was done correctly in rainwater harvesting itself. And uh, we also have one key aspect because often we want to have legumes in our system to build up vegetation, leguminous trees uh, or legumes in um, agriculture. And uh, for example, uh, the legumes will fail if there is no molybdenum. So the, the nitrogen, uh, nitrogenesis needs molybdenum. And if that is failing, erosion may continue. So there are so many levels to this and they are hardly addressed um, all at the same time because people are so um, in, inside their boxes and they are experts in their field, but idiots in everything else. Uh, in the worst case. And, and I speak from experience. This is not so rare. And being expert in one field, many people have the strange assumption they know everything. And, and that's, of course, uh, pretty ridiculous, but leads to failure of projects easily. So then um, trees can restore soils. And so before thinking of 
making big structures with uh, building terraces and um, all that. Um, maybe it would be enough to start um, restoring some type of uh, well vegetation and this has been described already by Russell Smith in uh, 1929 and he saw all the erosion uh, going on and uh, so this is a um, way of jumping directly from a, from a savanna situation into reforestation, doing it with uh, tr trees, parts of the trees, always some natural trees, uh, high biodiversity, but also trees that are producing food. So that's why uh, he was calling his uh, approach tree crops. And uh, so that would be a jump start and uh, that can generate income uh, pretty fast, especially with the world champion Moringa tree, uh, because that gives fruit very fast. And sweet chestnut is one of my favorites. Just yesterday I have replanted one that was that I planted in the wrong place where a house will be built. So I have replanted it into um, a part of a forest where it will contribute to diversity and hopefully give some fruit. Um, so, uh, not all forests are restoring areas. To the contrary, you can actually destroy a catchment with a uh, eucalyptus forest. So this is a picture uh, of a eucalyptus forest and uh, this was observed by uh, Klaas Menke. So this looks like a nice forest but if you go inside you see that it's completely eroding and um, I was stunned when I uh, saw these pictures um, because I always thought well forest is good to have and prevents erosion but uh, eucalyptus is uh, sort of killing off everything else, roots going very deep, sucking out the water from very, very deep down and everything else can die off. And then you're getting to savanna areas and um, that's leading nowhere. Unfortunately, uh, well, many consider this uh, a very, high income generating uh, species and um, of course uh, if the whole region is destroyed thereafter this is uh, maybe income generated for the person doing it or for the company doing it but um, for the whole region and community this is a big loss and it's also inviting further degradation uh, afterwards. So we need plant coverage. I have shown this in other lectures. So uh, if we have basically, if we have plant vegetation, uh, we will have water going into the ground. If we don't have vegetation cover, uh, the water will typically not infiltrate. It will run off, it will evaporate and so on. Um, so only with the plants we will have uh, soil like a sponge. So the rhizosphere is uh, doing the trick uh, like a sponge soaking up uh, the rain and bringing it into the, into the ground. So the plant is the best rainwater harvester we can have. <laughs> so, okay. So, um, um, there is also the splash effect where soil is compacted by the raindrops falling and then it's further compacted. And um, then of course we do have illegal logging that often leads to um, the hillsides being uh, bare like you can see here. It's a picture I've taken in Ethiopia and as you see this is a modern truck and uh, it's not always poor people doing the logging, illegal logging. 
uh, but it's also uh, mafia type structures where gangs are coming in and stealing all the vegetation and leaving uh, people in the region with uh, increasing water scarcity and loss of livelihoods. Okay, uh, this can be counteracted uh, sometimes in surprising ways and this is something where uh, I very much like the work of uh, Tony Rinodo and one of his many projects, so look this man up, he has done stunning things, look him up in uh, YouTube and so on, just take the video away to, that you have the link here and um, so Tony Rinodo has seen that um, once trees are cut down, uh, many trees grow back, but they become bushes. And then this animal will graze it down again. And so there is not much improvement to be seen. Uh, but when you cut off, and there, that's where the knife is coming in, if you cut all but one of the uh, new uh, twigs uh, and protect it. So that's also part of it to make protection. Uh, so a little, little fence around or something so that uh, while it is growing, it is protected. Uh, then it can grow out of the reach of uh, cattle and you have another tree without needing to plant one because the root system is still there, still active. And uh, this has really changed region. So on satellite image, uh, you could see the, um, the success of this, uh, these measures coming from here to here. Just, just imagine such a simple thing. And uh, it can really uh, change the face of the earth. Um, to be more efficient, it is important to get away from all the uh, inefficient burning on uh, three stone stoves uh, and to get to wood gas stoves. And wood gas uh, can uh, make carbonization instead, instead of incineration. It's a lot more efficient and families can even earn money uh, from uh, from cooking uh, with this method and that's uh, making a big difference for the for the livelihoods of, of uh, people that are uh, poor uh, so that's something where uh, this can be really uh, change the life of those that are doing this and it's uh, proceeding well and uh, this one on the uh, right hand side the Noah stove uh, that was invented by Marius Birik um, um, is even having an official um, well a license for Ethiopia now and it's very very difficult to get so great shout out to Marius that was uh, absolutely fantastic that you have such a standing and these are made from loam, so locally available material, relatively cheap. And so this can change the uh, well demand for wood dramatically. So the, the, the wood consumption can go down compared to three stone stove, can go down um, by 50, 60, 70 percent easily and people will be more healthy. Some of the charcoal can go to the market, replace illegal logging charcoal production. And uh, the dusty part, what is normally around 10%, can be put into the compost to make terra preta soil. So once again, we have all these connections, everything is interlinked and good ideas should be brought in together. Yeah, animals also like a reminder, also the, the animals that are causing degradation in the first place. Uh, instead of uh, starting a huge rainwater harvesting project and banning animals, uh, it might be worthwhile to look at um, holistic blend grazing and um, with that 
we could have like uh, restoration going on plots for a day um, and while if you if you have the animals running around in a in a large area uh, well things are getting worse and worse because they will keep uh, vegetation down but if you keep them going from one plot to the other uh, this plot can restore very fast and uh, this has proven to work very well. Uh, Alan Savory made this famous but it's also existing in, um, in um, traditional uh, farming also in Germany. I know a farmer who does this since 40 years in uh, southern Germany near the Alps and uh, you find great materials on uh, holistic plant grazing, rotational grazing, savory institute and others. Um, well obviously I say these things because normally you won't hear that in rainwater harvesting lectures but uh, if you don't know these things you, you may jump into well we need uh, to build terraces, we need to build reservoirs and everything but just changing um, the, the grazing patterns can Im increase the income for people, restore the land just by itself and then if the land is uh, green and productive again rainwater harvesting is at its best without any reservoir, without any uh, terracing and, and expensive stuff or stuff that is really a big project. So simply by changing the management it's benefiting people directly. They can have three much three times as, as, as many pieces of cattle when they do this. Um, another example uh, water efficiency should come first. So uh, how can you start a rainwater harvesting um, project if you if you are not going first for water efficiency. So uh, it shouldn't be uh, rainwater harvesting for wasting water in the wrong type of agriculture. And one great example of this is the um, the system of rice intensification where you have the wider spacing in uh, rice production. It's a it's a dry rice system, so um, it's organic, so it works with compost. Here's the compost heap. Also intercropping, so they build trees here for having compost and it's uh, also an uh, agroforestry system in that way. And um, yeah, but it works very well. It, it is uh, bringing down water consumption dramatically. And so uh, if rainwater harvesting is needed, uh, afterwards uh, it will be a lot easier and a lot more stable and of course this applies to many of the of the other techniques uh, that are existing around the world that we are covering in these lectures partly but there is luckily there's so many great things that we can only cover a very small percentage of that. I'm happy about that. And then the main thing plowed soil destroyed by agrochemicals. They will compact and normally the water will not go in so easily. So this is very, very poor, uh, poor rainwater harvesting, such a compacted soil. And uh, on the other hand, if you have no plow, direct seeding soil, uh, regenerative agriculture, see the other lecture for, for the topic, that is rainwater harvesting agriculture. So this soil, as I said, the vegetation cover is making the difference. Uh, the picture I showed you before, well, soil that doesn't have vegetation cover and the rain will not go in easily, if at all. And so it's evaporating, it's running off and not available in uh, the dry time to come. And regenera regenerative agriculture is one of the key elements of um, restoration and it is a rainwater harvesting technique in my point of view. Now a little bit on uh, small scale uh, rainwater harvesting and uh, it is something that can 
help on a community level, individual and uh, for the whole village. And um, we have uh, the different components, as I have shown before. We have a catchment, conveyance system, filtering, separation can be part of that. Um, storage is, of course, uh, crucial. Uh, treatment often needed. A good treatment for storage would be uh, floating plants, for example, so duckweed or whatever and then delivery of the water, utilization and filtering, disinfection for drinking purpose, purposes may be needed. So normally the catchment would be a rooftop um, or a part of a garden, um, whatever is available uh, on the small scale. If you go for community scale, uh, there can be swales built into parking lots. Uh, so you see this form here. Uh, these are the swales. Here's another one, not so visible. Um, and uh, you should note that um, if you make such swales, they shouldn't be deeper than 25 centimeters if completely filled, because otherwise there's a risk of, uh, well, children drowning. Uh, if that really happens so much, I don't know, but that's, an, that's a concern that comes up right away and uh, that should be taken seriously. Uh, I took this picture in Australia very long ago and uh, so I like this very much because in the background uh, you see uh, this here is ocean. This is uh, a bay from the Pacific Ocean and water that is running off from here would normally go into the ocean and being lost. So um, if you have a trench like this, the water will be captured here in the trench. It can infiltrate into the groundwater, avoid the um, incoming uh, salination from the groundwater because in drought very often the um, groundwater is getting too saline because the water um, of the seawater may intrude if there is too much abstraction and too little recharge and through rainwater harvesting you build a barrier against um, salination of the groundwater. Then uh, swales, it's the cheapest of all. So um, I was planning one of my, my first bigger projects that was a whole settlement for 250 people. And I was doing this um, innovative sanitation system. And of course, we didn't want to put any uh, rainwater runoff into a sewage system. So we could build these uh, swales and uh, these swales um, require a soil that is sort of um, pervious enough. So it should be sort of sandy soil and uh, then you also here you will have to provide uh, vegetation cover and you need to take into account uh, the behavior of people. So if you make a swale in a direction where people often take shortcuts or jaywalk, uh, then you would sort of, um, well, invite people to trample on the swale and it would become impervious easily and uh, a mess at the same time. So install them in a way that it's not an easy shortcut for people but have vegetation cover and when you make the swale you should be aware that there will be at one point there will be grass cutting necessary so you have to make sure that the machinery available can do the grass cutting also inside the swale otherwise it may be uh, not well maintained. Um, yeah some text uh, those who want to look more can stop the video for a moment. 
um, some more pictures uh, of this and of course you can have um, some small uh, check dams inside to allow for more infiltration and um, you also have to consider if this is like a very long swale uh, it may start eroding and, and that's why you, you can build in these uh, well, check dams and avoid that. So be aware of the power of, of the water. Um, in case that the infiltration will not work in a, in a simple swale, you may have to build uh, infiltration trenches and infiltration trenches uh, are well normally filled with gravel, um, sand filter below and the thing is that the soil below is still uh, relatively impervious but the key to understanding is that this is the storage so in a heavy uh, rain or storm uh, there will be a lot of water there and this water instead of running off at the surface will well be in the trench and from there it can be um, infiltrating uh, into the surroundings uh, over time so infiltration takes time uh, the heavy showers are often very short and I'm not talking about uh, monsoon areas because monsoon uh, rain is not really uh, allowing infiltration very much. Only if you have large areas of land uh, and space for many, many trenches and swales. Uh, but for monsoon areas, you usually have the monsoon drain and you can combine those with uh, like uh, reservoir structures and so on but that's a different story uh, these things are rather for uh, like uh, climates with uh, erratic rainfall and not these very very heavy ones that we can experience in uh, monsoon areas okay so um, the rainwater harvesting um, is a process of collecting, conveying, and storing rainfall from a catchment for beneficial use, of course. Um, different systems are available, and um, the most promising alternatives for supplying fresh water in the face of increasing water scarcity and escalating demand. Uh, because um, the situation in areas with uh, well uh, droughts uh, is very often that we will see uh, the um, well water being wasted in uh, the rainy season or in the time where it is more rainy and then in the dry uh, times this water is simply lacking so you you normally would take water that is wasted away washed off causing erosion causing landslides causing people to drown uh, destroy roads and all you would keep that water on the premises on the ground in the area within the catchment uh, sub catchment and avoid all the above problems and at the same time uh, gain a resource. So rainwater harvesting can be a win-win-win-win-win situation. Um, then uh, a few words about the rooftop um, rainwater harvesting. So this is where the rainwater that is running off is collected in storage tank that's a picture I, uh, I have put in to show that also larger tanks are possible. These ones, the smaller ones, are um, easy to get. They are in hardware stores. Um, and um, there is uh, a lot of, well, 
units in the market. So a lot has been developed, great devices and some are not so great. Uh, one of the key things would be to avoid to, too much dirt uh, getting from the roofs into the tanks. So there may, may be bird droppings uh, and the uh, dry deposition over the dry season. So better provide for a first flush uh, discard uh, that uh, the, the water that goes into the tank is cleaner, especially the first rain after a long dry season shouldn't really get into the tank. And uh, that is something that can be built easily so that the first five to 10 minutes are discarded and then uh, the rest goes into the tank. Um, Here's some more examples of this can be done. Uh, so the knowledge is there. Uh, look it up if you want to design uh, such a unit. There can be a filter on the top. You could have a, a, a coarse filter already in the, in the gutters. And uh, then you can also even recharge the groundwater with the overflow. And look at this one, it's a very, very small one, uh, but uh, don't make a storage that is open um, because then you will breed uh, thousands of mosquitoes and that can be really annoying and even dangerous uh, with malaria. And so the tanks should be covered and um, even the, the bigger uh, reservoirs that are open should have a cover of floating plants to avoid uh, mosquito infestation. And uh, that's also uh, something where to make these larger tanks, uh, there is uh, ferrocement used and uh, the structure is given by the uh, by the steel, steel casket that can be easily woven uh, locally uh, and instead of making um, uh, big structures to, to uh, pour the concrete um, you can just put it in by hand uh, from both sides and uh, then that can make a nice uh, tank and those can be pretty big uh, compared to the, the plastic material you get from the, from the hardware stores. Okay, um, the design, of course, there is um, the pattern of rainfalls, uh, the, the, well, the volumes you get, the dry month, the uh, wet month. And as I said, it's not uh, so reliable anymore. That's why the planning is uh, often not working out so well. Um, but uh, there would be an example, look at the rainfall patterns and uh, then from there you can go to the monthly um, averages and you see um, that there are some months that are exceeding the demand and some months that uh, have a lack of water and so you would store excess and get this to the time where there would be too little. Okay, um, yeah, there are also different ways of, uh, uh, well, uh, cutting off when the tank is full, avoiding uh, dirty stuff going in or see this man cleaning the roof uh, before the rainy season in order to have clean rainwater from day one. And um, you normally can't rely on uh, proactive people who are doing that too much. So make systems um, failure safe. So it's, it's a question of uh, hygiene and so on. And uh, so, um, then for really drinking the water, 
disinfection is recommended. Um, and uh, so there are the usual ways, boiling, very high energy demand, very, very expensive. Very good one, uh, slow sand filtration that can be built uh, easily. Uh, solar disinfection or chlorine dioxide, dioxide that's a very safe um, uh, way of very, very efficient disinfection and the material is dissolving completely by itself. Um, yeah, the rainwater harvesting techni techniques, uh, micro catchment I've shown you now. So they are up to 500 square meters. And then now we go to macro catchment. And these are catchments of uh, three to 30 hectares. Uh, and of course, even more. And uh, they normally have uh, big and small reservoirs, sand dams, cisterns, open ponds, earth dams, stream diversion, and um, different types of irrigation. So rainwater harvesting on catchment level. This is a picture from um, Dying Wisdom, a book about Indi India's traditional water harvesting systems from CSE, Center of Science and Environment in India, a great book of the old techniques. And um, there is also these um, situations where there is no groundwater. And uh, if the area doesn't have groundwater, you can build your own groundwater table uh, by making um, this uh, unit that is uh, making the uh, runoff um, uh, yeah, much, much less than it would normally be or seal it off completely. So that would be a underground um, storage facility. And that's of course great because there is not very much evaporation. It can work with agriculture directly um, and it's uh, kept clean. It's a sand filtration at the same time. Uh, and uh, so subsurface dams are a great technique and also belong to the ancient ones. And um, so that would be a series of these uh, sand dams. And um, so this would fill up with water, this would fill up. And uh, quite a few years back, uh, Josep was a student of ours and uh, when he saw these pictures, he really got interested in, in these techniques. And then when he uh, did his masters, uh, he afterwards started working in um, East Africa to look for the sand dams that have been implemented to learn how successful they uh, are. And um, he has, uh, well, worked extensively on uh, evaluating these structures and he has seen that most of them are failing and that's very sad because like this is a big effort for a community to build something like that and the key thing and that's what I learned from him then I wasn't really aware of that um, in detail a key thing is that um, if you build sand dams, you want to collect sand. And obviously, if you make a, a whole dam in one step, that's a big volume of water and that will be a sedimentation unit. So then the, um, the silt will go down. So they shouldn't be built in one step, but in small steps. So that would be the first uh, dry to rainy season. And when you do that, you would have only this much water. So it would be 
still very turbulent when the when the flooding is coming in and so it would wash out the silt and uh, it would collect sand and then on top of that the next season you build another one and once again high turbulence because the lower part is filled by sand already and that way you really get a sand dam and that's of course great because then you can uh, really have a, a storage unit and uh, so to make infiltrate and what uh, Josep de la Trincheria uh, from Spain has has found is that most of them are built uh, improperly not really doing the job many of the people are not realizing that they are not working as they could they have very small capacity uh, in uh, many cases and could do much better and uh, Josep is still working in this field and uh, contributing to positive change in the world and I'm very glad about this he's one of the many who learned about these things and made it his profession and I think I think he's really happy with this because he's enthusiastic and please do the things that are making you enthusiastic where you say well this is what I want to do and things will arrange okay so um, some more examples of water harvesting structures for agriculture so there are um, different ways of, of making patterns where the water is collecting so this one is uh, an interesting one works with uh, slopey areas uh, so there would be fences built around and uh, if it rains the water would collect in the lowest part of it and then you will plant a tree in this place because there the water will remain and so that's the first part of cultivating this piece of land and of course the same can be done here with this uh, terraces you would plant here where the water is staying and then the rest will be uh, well restored over time uh, this is an example from uh, Ethiopia uh, the Konso region that is great in this so also traditionally uh, made in this way and um, from here uh, you have a lot of water captured in every rainy season and plants will grow well and this is uh, a project that we have done from uh, our institute mainly by master thesis uh, bachelor thesis and uh, one doctorate by Jan Wibbing and uh, we have worked in an area that uh, has enormous erosion so look at this uh, barren land here so when it rains the water will rush down and so we started uh, to work with the authority with Avamensch University and uh, we have designed with the help of master thesis work um, to create uh, such swales so here a swale is dug and so the water will be kept in the region and as you see here uh, the water is captured and um, the uh, result was measured and it has shown that there is uh, 350 cubic meters 350,000 liters of water um, captured in one day it infiltrates within uh, 24 hours um, and uh, can refill the groundwater and provides water in the fields um, so that's something what can work very well and uh, our approach is to combine this with uh, agroforestry so to bring in the trees so with uh, making living terraces and this is a project what Jan Wibbing and Stefan Hügel uh, have uh, done as their research work the revival website has a tree 
a selector tool from Stefan Hügel that is really great. So which trees can be put into such situations. <clears throat> and then restoration can be long term. So if you only make swales and not do some planting and um, having people take care of it, um, so ideally with family farms, uh, then this can be for everyone. Uh, another good example of natural rainwater harvesting is like uh, avoid uh, vegetation loss. And so on this part here you see a lot is growing. There are trees and on the other side this area uh, is sort of barren and destroyed. So it's a project new tree in Burkina Faso. Yeah, then uh, some examples from around the world, and these are really, really stunning. So look at these enormous structures that have been built over generations and that are serving hundreds and thousand generations in, in many cases. And then look how ridiculous it is to make an economic balance in like break even in uh, one and a half years or two years. Um, when you can make things that are serving people over generations. So that's thinking for a good future and not thinking to fill the pockets of a few companies in short time. Um, and still the designers uh, can make a good living from that. So there is no contradiction here. But not only looking at the next few years to come, we, we need to be long term to go to the green planet. Else we will not have that many generations left on Earth, most probably. Yeah, stone buns um, in many eroded areas, stones are abundant. I've also sometimes uh, just um, built some little uh, check dams. Uh, from rock lying around and I have, well, at, at one point I have taken the time that it required to make a little check dam. It was about a meter high in an erosion gully and you work from top down, of course, so to stop the erosion in the, in the top um, of the trench because otherwise the rest of it will be uh, uh, just uh, thrown away by the next uh, rainwater runoff um, and it was ridiculously simple. It was hard work to, to move some rocks um, but uh, if you look that um, I could sort of make a gully plug uh, in, a, in an erosion uh, gully within like uh, 30 minutes and uh, well more plugs would uh, have required similar time spans, maybe more if you move down down the gully where it gets wider. Uh, but just imagine how long lasting the effects could be, how, how the erosion could be prevented and how um, vegetation cover could be kept by just avoiding the water to run off and not only the water but also the soil. Soil is very often running off. Um, yeah, there is a long tradition of rainwater harvesting in India. I've shown this book before. So rainwater harvesting in India, it's actually one of the main countries for making this approach um, uh, popular again. And this is uh, partly due to the success of uh, Center for Science and uh, Environment in Delhi. Uh, but they built on the work of some elders who have really done that and who could teach us a lesson of or two. Uh, check them for aquifer recharge and as you see uh, it's a community effort so people are um, getting together and they get things done. And as I said proper planning is key so when um, check dam is built make sure that there is some infiltration happening here 
and uh, so when the water level is rising that you could uh, rise the level of um, groundwater. As I said, it's, it's good knowledge is necessary, good surveying, uh, use geological maps, look at the area, make infiltration tests in different points and so on. <coughs> of course, retention is a key issue in rainwater harvesting, especially before you get uh, the vegetation cover back. Um, you often need some um, storage and so if you have some uh, reservoirs uh, that can help to restore the region and um, one of the key things is to if you are in areas with uh, high evaporation put in duckweed uh, and azolla um, so the floating plants they can avoid evaporation they can be great fodder for fish and uh, also for chicken and um, ducks duckweed name is indicating this they love it and the eggs of chicken and um, uh, ducks that eat this green stuff is far better than this than the quality if they eat grain because then the value is very low and that's the normal stuff we find in the supermarkets so go for it and make it multifunctional have uh, fish in here um, uh, I don't know if I get a duck going maybe should have feet as well okay so uh, here are gully plugs and um, these are actually very well built and be aware of the enormous power of water so in, a, in our Ethiopia project we lost uh, a few gully plugs because we couldn't get to the upper part of the catchment for logistical regions, reasons it was not accessible to us with our limited resources so we started further down the gullies and uh, the power of the water is so enormous that such, some of the structures got um, uh, washed away even though we were um, protecting them with uh, mesh wire and so on. You can fill mesh wire with uh, rock that makes a very stable uh, type of material and um, yeah Sometimes it uh, is necessary to also make uh, concrete structures uh, like here and uh, make sure that the water when it comes down preferably goes in the middle. So you must avoid water bypassing because that can destroy the whole structure and even if you have a concrete structure uh, that could be destroyed in a short period of time. So plug that off very, very, very well on this to the sides. Otherwise, that will not have a long lifespan. Um, yeah, of course, there are some calculations that can be, be done. And uh, that's too much for this lecture. This is just to show um, that you should look at that. So that would be the uh, rainwater harvesting area and that should be having a good relation to the cropping area and you can make it all in one or in also several steps and the agriculture should become rainwater harvesting agriculture by and in itself on the premises as well. Um, yeah, some calculations that can be done uh, and uh, there is some materials that can be found here and uh, for uh, you, you need to know the crop, uh, you need the water requirement, uh, design rainfall, runoff coefficient, efficiency factor and um, it's uh, quite a lot so the sorghum would require around 500 millimeters of rain and in uh, semi-arid areas this is simply not there 
So then you need a space that is uh, more than three times bigger than uh, you will uh, have the, the land itself. Okay, so um, a few words on uh, particip uh, participatory approaches. So rainwater harvesting on community level really lives from uh, having um, the community involvement, otherwise it can easily fail, fail. Everybody should participate, else it will uh, well, be very difficult to convince others why are they uh, sitting back, why should I work when others are not, so get them all um, informed, interested, and then let them, let them decide uh, to do it or not to do it. And um, as I said before, the best thing is really to uh, look into good examples around and to show people um, that it's something where uh, the, the, the change can be from poverty uh, to, uh, to wealth. And uh, that's and uh, participatory approaches, um, identification of uh, the determinants, determinants for the crop production. So people should be asked what they would normally uh, grow. And uh, then um, the, um, well, choice could also be uh, to ask if there are uh, less water consuming crops uh, that they would accept to um, to grow at least uh, over a time span until the situation is improved and then identification of indigenous rainwater harvesting measure practices and opportunities because that's what people would know and refer to and very often the elders, the, the grandparents, grand grandparents are a great source of knowledge because they still have um, the knowledge. Um, and uh, while the younger generation may have lost this, uh, the older ones still remember these things. And normally it's quite a relief for them when people start thinking about the future again and do the things their forefathers have done. Then identification of new rainwater harvesting uh, techniques or combinations with the indigenous ones, illustration of the techniques and uh, that would be like uh, having uh, good video material and um, Normally, like slideshows uh, don't work very well because people often are not trained in uh, abstract thinking or understanding uh, graphs, but uh, video will do. Uh, there must be people in there to give the scale and uh, so um, there is one <laughs> one thing I was told from a uh, malaria awareness uh, campaign and the person uh, was presenting and everybody was sitting there and looking at the at the slides and uh, he was showing a picture of a mosquito uh, and on the slide of course it looked enormous and so after he did his job and he uh, thought of a job well done, um, he asked people for comments and then one of the participants was, uh, um, well, uh, rising his hand and saying, yeah, the, very nice what you have been telling us, but we don't have mosquitoes that big here. And so he was dismissing the whole thing because it's like, uh, this type of abstract thinking is something we need to train. It's not coming naturally. And that's why we should show video from real life with real scale and with real situations where things are shown how they should be. Don't show what should not be because that's remembered easily. 
and of course then selection of the most appropriate technique. Uh, field ev evaluation and the whole design. But the key thing is that uh, you need to get together with people and I have this experience with, uh, I did a lot of uh, work in sanitation also in different parts of Africa and Southeast Asia. It's very simple to get people together in rural areas but it's very difficult to get your message over with like this cultural gap and um, so be aware of how people think, involve local people and uh, follow how they are normally uh, working, thinking, relate to, to examples that they know and uh, so that uh, would work a lot better. Not saying that it's easy. Yeah. Watershed management, and this is coming now uh, to an end. Uh, the terraces, uh, this is an example, and this would be along the contours. So this would be the, well, it's not very visible here, along the contour line here. And um, then uh, the terraces are built and you should uh, have a little bit of um, an inclination into this direction. So very often terraces are this way and then the water runs off easily. So that's not the thing to do. Uh, we want uh, the water to keep in the terrace and infiltrate and um, to keep it um, stable, stable, uh, we need to have vegetation cover here. And this is an example. So if there is a uh, swale, uh, a, a terrace built here, um, we can bring in compost from sanitation. For example, from terrapita compost, the charcoal from wood gas uh, application and plant a tree to get new wood and wood gas and food. Um, the animals will be panned up, not going around and uh, killing trees. Um, they would get their fodder from this moringa tree, for example. Very good fodder. Animals are very, very healthy. And uh, then uh, the moringa uh, would be for soil building and fodder production. And um, well, the, the moringa doesn't make a good wood, so there should be other trees as well for uh, fire for the wood gas stoves and for construction purposes. So always make mixed cultures. Uh, monoculture has so many downsides. And uh, surprisingly, it's uh, still what is done most. All right, so I'm through with what I wanted to present. Some resources here, so stop the video or uh, you can also download the slides um, and there are some uh, websites for uh, rainwater harvesting and so on. I've shown some pictures from the rainfoundation.org and uh, you can look at the materials of uh, the CSE, CSE Center for Science and Environment in Delhi because I just see it's lacking on this slide. And with this I come to the conclusions. Uh, systems thinking, soil, water, food, uh, look at uh, these different sectors together, look at the social situation and um, work with the people, um, help them to have livelihoods, so rather go for systems that are creating family farms than just reforestation. Um, if you do reforestation, always include uh, an, um, a percentage of edible trees so that people can have a living from, from those. Um, and 
The basics of rainwater harvesting is we have like on-site and off-site systems. Um, we should integrate with the overall situation. So if we can change agriculture to regenerative agriculture, that may be the best and most profitable, most long-lasting way of rainwater harvesting. Of course, even though may, most people working in rainwater harvesting uh, wouldn't think of that as a rainwater harvesting technique, but of course it is. Also, the um, well, the, the rotational grazing and, and uh, some of the other stuff that I've shown. So that's about the integration with the overall situation. Then we have the small scale, the reservoirs. Be aware that that doesn't really go a long way normally, especially it's not for more than a small house garden. Uh, or you would need enormous um, tanks, but then the roof might be too small. And so rainwater harvesting on catchment level is what I'm promoting mostly. So that can change the world. And uh, that's something what is, uh, well, my driving force, because uh, hopefully you realize that I am enthusiastic on these topics. And uh, so I have followed my own enthusiasm. I'm very happy with that. And uh, so I'm glad that you are interested, that you followed through this lecture. And so leave your comments um, below, pose questions there, and hopefully you will get involved. So thank you very much.